Hey church, welcome from wherever you may be joining us. My name is Alan. If you are here in person on one of our campuses, go ahead and scan the QR code in the back of your seat. Reason being is we wanna to get to know you. We wanna to get to know who you are, what your story is, and we can connect with you that way. If you're online, you can go to oneandall.church slash new for the same exact reason. Today, I'm here with one of my best friends in the whole world, Mr. Ian Roswinski. Ian, how you doing, man? Good, how are you? Good to be here. Good, good, it's so handsome. Uh, <laughs> you know, I know you personally, and I know one of your favorite things to do is to serve. Like, do you, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, one of my favorite places to serve is the young adults community. Uh, that community is so amazing. It's so, so much fun to worship, so much fun to come and hear the messages. Um, I fully believe that the closer you grow together with people, the further you'll grow together individually and together. Yeah, that's good. Um, it's such an amazing community. And the best thing that I love is the worship. If you've ever been to a prayer night, think of that times 10. <laughs> yeah, the worship, the worship is incredible. So I mean, the word around the campus, the word around the street, the word yeah. outside of these four walls oh, yeah. is that when you come to young adults, you you can experience something different. That that you know our Sunday experience is incredible. Yep. But there's just something a little bit different about a Tuesday night. Uh, what do, what do you think that is? Is it just like the 18 to 30? Fully think, think it's the Holy Spirit movie. The Holy Spirit. 100. percent I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Yeah, I think that when ages 18 to 30 come, and we seek God together, I feel like we truly can make a change in, in this next generation oh, yeah. that's Good. coming up. Yeah. So hey, if that's you, if you're saying, I wanna be a part of that community, I wanna come and experience what we're even talking about, this Tuesday, April 12th, seven o'clock, you can come at 6.30 and hang with us a little bit earlier. We wanna see you there. Also, I would love to mention after Easter, we're doing a new series called Pumped. It's about scriptures that take you places, scriptures that get you excited, scriptures that get you pumped up. I'm really excited for it, so let's take a look at this video. Hey, this is Pastor Jeff. We're about to start a new series called Pumped. You know, I've been an athlete all my life and I've noticed that every good athlete I've ever met has some kind of way to motivate themselves, to pump themselves up, so to speak, to ready themselves for battle and ultimately a victory. I think we Christ followers are the same way. We're in battle every day of our lives and there's gotta be something in our lives to motivate us, to make our heart race a bit faster, to make our pulse race, to fire us up, to get us ready to produce this kind of intestinal fortitude where we're ready to do battle. And I think scripture is given to us by God for that very reason. When you read it and it resonates with you, you can take specific passages and suddenly you find yourself ready and willing. And in your mind, you're gonna be victorious in these battles. So we're starting a new series. It's called Pumped. We're gonna deliver some of those passages to you. I want to encourage you to bring a friend, a relative, but make sure you're there yourself so that the Word of God may empower you to overcome the circumstances of your life, to live above them, and to have victories you never thought or never knew you could have. God bless you. Pumped. See you soon. That series is going to be great. I already know. But today, Pastor Jeff is here. We're going to continue in our Eat and Remember series. Let's get into service. And let's get to the moment we waited seven days for. Welcome, Welcome to, to One and All. Well, hey, everyone, and welcome to church this weekend. We're so excited to see you. Would you stand with us as we join together to worship? Come on, all across this place, let's put our hands together.
up one and all. Who's grateful to be at church tonight? Yeah. You guys can go ahead and take your seats. My name is Kelly Soilis, and I am the campus pastor out at Rancho. As my friend over here said, I get to hang out on the other side of the tracks tonight. Uh, but it's so good to be here with you guys. And for those of you joining us online, we just want to say welcome. Uh, if you're joining us for the very first time, uh, you can find out more about all of the amazing things going on here at One and All by scanning that QR code on the seat back in front of you or by going to oneandall.church forward slash new. Well, if you did not know, just this last week, last Wednesday, there were approximately 400 young people in this room for our, our youth. Yeah, we can give that up. Uh, and I'm really grateful because I actually have two teenagers. You can start praying for me now. Um, no, they're great kids, but they were here on Wednesday, and I know it was a phenomenal time. Uh, they celebrated the... Uh, they got a new youth pastor on their team, Miss Shannon Hardy, and uh, it was a great time. So thank you for your generosity and your faithful giving. It makes so many things possible, including us helping the youth in our community grow closer to God. Uh, well, today we're going to be continuing in our Eat and Remember series, and Pastor Jeff is going to be talking to us about the Feast of Yom Kippur. So will you all join me as we pray right now and just prepare our hearts for the message. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you. Thank you for all of my friends who have joined us here tonight. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of uh, this wonderful church community. I ask that you would be with Pastor Jeff as he delivers the truth from your word. And I ask that your word would go deep into our hearts, that it would change us, and that we would leave this place uh, just with a renewed sense of our vision to help those far from God come near. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Feast of Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement, was on the 10th day of the seventh month. There were purification offerings, a day when Israel's sins focused on one goat, and it was sent out from the camp, representing almost as if we're going back to a pristine, sinless state before God. God is renewing, in a sense, His holiness. That's where we get the term scapegoat someone who is blamed for the wrongdoings of someone else. Yom Kippur points to the fullness of redemption in Jesus and the final redemption that establishes God's kingdom. Well, hello everybody. My name is Grace and I will be reading this passage with you guys. I'm so welcome to be here, and well, ho I hope you like this passage. Gotta find the passage first. The Lord said to Moses, the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Holy sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement. When atonement is made for you before the... <coughs> okay. Lord, your God... Those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. I will destroy from among their people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is the lasting ordinance for generations to come wherever you live. It is a day of Sabbath. Rest for you and must deny yourselves from the evening of the ninth day of the month until the following evening you are to observe your Sabbath. Thank you, Grace. She'll be preaching in no time. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 16, uh, Grace Gibb, her name is Grace, 
And uh, we've, we've been on this incredible journey together. And I, you notice the board's not here. Have you noticed? Because I don't want you thinking technically. I'm going to give your brain some time off this weekend. I want you to sit back and think about it. I want to give you an experience because we're talking about the Day of Atonement. And I, I just want you to relax. We're going to go back a few thousand years to this New Year's annual event. Now, you know it as Rosh Hashanah. God sits in judgment over his people. The trumpet would blow. The congregation would assemble. And this is the day, as we've learned in the past, where the people of Israel would learn about their blessings, their rewards, or if God was going to remove his favor based on the manner in which they had lived out the, the, their life the, the, the previous year. So Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year, new year, the first day would then inaugurate 10 days of awe. And in these 10 days of awe, there's going to be serious, deep soul searching. Now, let me just ask you quickly. When's the last time you took 10 days off and you just went somewhere and thought about the way you were living? Man, it's been a long time, hasn't it? That's because we live in the concrete jungle. You know, we're busy. And there's a, there's a real detriment to that because we never take the time to really do some serious soul searching about where we are with God in the moment and how we've been living our lives. So God comes to his people to make sure that they do this. And that's why you've heard me say, I think it's extremely difficult to live a Christ-like life in the culture in which you and I live. You're going to have to be intentional because if you're not intentional, you'll be carried away by the flow of the world. And so God said, I want you to go and quieten yourself. I want you to think about your life for 10 days. I want solitude and introspection. There better not be any work on those days. I'll cut you off from the people. Pretty severe. And this day is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, something that you have learned in the past as we've gone through these feasts is that as you look at them, as you look at these celebrations, it should have become clear to you by now that in the Western culture, we tend to think in terms of lists or propositions, right? Of definitions and precise words. For instance, grace name means unmerited favor. Grace means undeserved mercy. We like to define our terms, our words. But in the Eastern culture, the culture in which the Bible takes place, they didn't think of definitions and precise words and lists. They do so more in the Greek than they do in the Hebrew, but they think more in visuals. If you're going to communicate something, you're going to demonstrate it. You're going to practice it. And so God institutes these feasts. And they're designed, we should have learned by now, to demonstrate who God is, who we are, and how God is planning on working in his world. In fact, God said to the people, you're going to have these feasts, and I, there are going to be times I'm going to come down and meet with you. And when I meet with you, you're going to learn a, a lot about who I am, your knowledge of the world, the created order, and your God. You're going to have a greater understanding, and as a result, you're going to be able to live your life in accordance to the precepts of God. In fact, have you noticed that every detail of the feast, the manner in which the food was prepared, the timing of the meal, the very menu itself are all images of our relationship with God. In fact, do you remember that the word feast is mikra? Do you know what mikra means? Rehearsal. The word for feast is rehearsal because the feasts were God's appointed times, illustrating for us what God wanted to do as he revealed himself in the present, what Messiah was going to do as he solidified the work and the plan of God, and then prophetically what was going to happen at the end of time. So here we come to Yom Kippur. There's this highly anticipated feast, this, this event where all of the people, nothing's like Yom Kippur, folks. They've had feasts before, nothing like Yom Kippur, because they're all going to gather out of their villages and insulas, and they're going to march their way up the hill to the top of the hill, to the temple, and they're going to have an awesome celebration, and the presence of God is going to fill the Holy of Holies. So in Leviticus 16, before Grace read Leviticus 23, this is what we read in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Wait a minute. Aaron's two sons died? We'll get to that in a moment. When they approached the Lord, that's when they died. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he's not to come uh, whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark. So Yahweh says to Moshe, right? Yahweh says to Moses, when you come into my presence, don't just waltz in here. 
like you're going to meet with a friend of yours, like you're coming in or walking into any other place. Because I'm going to come down and I'm going to meet you there. So you go and you tell your brother Aaron, you're not going to come unclean. You're going to put on the full vestments. You're going to put on the, the breast piece with the 12 stones representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And God doesn't stop there. He says, you tell your brother Aaron that when he comes into the most holy place, verse 3, he must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He's to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. In other words, the text says, you tell your brother Aaron, the dress code for this event is not smart casual. Most Californians would not fit in. No jeans, no untucked shirts. You tell him to put on the full vestments representing the 12 tribes of Israel. But what's interesting, he even talks about, if I can be so crass, Aaron's underwear. You tell him, I want the sacred linen tunics underneath and the linen undergarments and I want the linen sash around his shoulders. I want you to strip down to your underwear and you're wearing a white hat. And then I want you to tell him before he does that, I want you to take a bath, the mikra or the mikbah, the washing with water. In other words, God says to Moses, you tell Aaron, you will come clean into my presence without blemish, without spot. Now, Aaron, the high priest took this very seriously because he lost both his sons in chapter 10. Nadab and Abihu died when they just waltzed into the presence of God, a lot of theologians, scholars believe they were inebriated, got a little too much to drink, just thought they could waltz into the presence of God. Both of them died. So Aaron's going to be taking this quite seriously. God said, you come clean, you cleanse yourself. In fact, we learn, in, and remember what we talked about, you have the Mishnah, the Talmud, you have others, the Tanakh, you have other sources of oral tradition that occurred surrounding these feasts, surrounding the practices of the Hebrews. We know from history that someone would actually be assigned to keep the priest up all night so that he wouldn't have any inappropriate dreams, couldn't go to sleep. Furthermore, a wife would be waiting in the wings in case his wife died overnight. He would marry immediately so that he would be cleansed, so that he would be pure. God said, I want a priest clean, I want my tabernacle clean, and I want my people clean on this day. Now, the... We don't have a lot describing, but what we do have concerning Yom Kippur is it's unbelievable euphoria because you've got 105 scholars, yes, actually, somewhere between 180 to 250,000 people marching up the hill to go into the tabernacle or the temple for Yom Kippur. That's a lot of people. Now, to compare that, you know, I grew up in Tennessee. And Tennessee, for a long time, had the largest football stadium in America for college football. Neyland Stadium seats 105,000. That's the largest football stadium for a long time, but now I think it's second or third because we built bigger and better. And I've been in Neyland Stadium for a Tennessee football game, and I can tell you it is absolute pandemonium. Everybody's a friend. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's wearing orange. They're high-fiving. You're high-fiving people you've never met. When the running back touches the ball, everybody stands up because of the possibilities. Peyton Manning was the quarterback for four years. I, I went to games when Peyton Manning was the quarterback, and when he started dropping back to pass, the whole crowd, 105,000 people stood on their feet because they knew something good was going to happen. Now double that, 105,000. Let's go to 210,000 worshipers, 12 tribes of Israel camped around the tent of meeting, the outer room, the inner room, the Holy of Holies, three tribes on all four sides, and then they all come to the mountain and God shows up. The lines between heaven and earth seem to be blurred at that moment. In fact, we have an ancient letter from Aristeus who witnessed the Day of Atonement in operation when Eleazar was the high priest, and this is what he said. It was an occasion of great amazement to us when we saw Eleazar, the high priest, engaged in his ministry and all the glorious vestments, including the wearing of the garment with precious stones upon it in which he is vested. There, the priest's appearance makes one awestruck and dumbfounded. A man would think he had come out of this world into another. I emphatically assert that every man who comes near this spectacle of what I have described will experience astonishment and amazement beyond words. There was something about the high priest the temple, the arrangement, 
the ritual that when you saw it, transported you somewhere else. That's why in the book of Psalms, you will read Psalms entitled Psalms of Ascent. Well, the ascent is from the village or the insulas up to the temple for the day of Yom Kippur. And you know, they would sing all the way. They wouldn't just waltz in. They would be singing and they would, they would kind of be singing prophetic songs. In other words, this, we're going to sing these songs and this is what we hope will happen. One psalm of the sin is Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? You're going to need help when you're coming before a sinless God, aren't you? Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. So once everybody's in place, and it's time for the priest to go as a representative for the people, this is so astounding. We've already read, he's to take two goats, remember? Two goats. One for the Lord, and one is the scapegoat. Now, if you've been here for long enough, you should know what the scapegoat is by now. I've, I've rehearsed this quite a few times. In verse 9, we're told, Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. So the first goat was a goat of atonement, which that word means the covering over of sin. There's a sacrifice. There's a pronouncement. The life in an animal is in the blood. The wages of sin is death. There's got to be a life given in order that sin is covered over. So first, there's the slaying of the goat, the atonement, the covering over. And then there's a second goat called the scapegoat. The scapegoat is for the removal of sin. And the word actually means, and we'll get to that in a moment, sent away. And it means sent away because the priest would take his hands on the second goat and place his hands on the head of that goat. And it was a symbolic symbolism of him taking all the sins of the people of Israel, placing it on the head of this goat, and then they would hire, that's right, a Gentile to come in and walk that goat out of the temple all the way out in the wilderness and throw it over a cliff. The symbolism was amazing. Remember how we talked about verse 10, but the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Now, we just said that the Hebrews thought more, not in terms of, of proposition or words, but more of pictures and symbols. The name of the goat is Azazel. That's a Hebrew word. And Azazel means the removal or sending away. And the general idea is this goat is carrying all the sins of the people out into the wilderness. Now, as that happened, euphoria would set in. Now think about it. You've had a bad year. You committed a lot of sins and you're not sure. God is bound by no covenant to do this. You're depending on his grace every year. So when the priest puts his hands on that goat and you've had a particularly bad year, you're going to be thinking, man, is that goat going to leave the building? That goat may not be going anywhere, man. If these people knew what I'd done last year, man, we may not be forgiven this year. I may, I may bring harm, you know, our crops, uh, there may not be wealth and prosperity among our children and grandchildren because of the way I live my life. If that goat doesn't leave, man, we're in trouble. So as they started to bring the goat out, we read in historical accounts, there'd be this cheering, you know, there he goes, Woo! there go our sins, yippee ki -yay! It's going to be a good year. Look at that, gone forever, never to be discussed again. That's why in Psalm 103, David writes, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions from us, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. Now, here's the other thing. The Day of Atonement was not an individualistic affair, it was communal. Let me tell you a good way, and if you're visiting here, or hopefully if this is your home, you'll stay. <laughs> but if you're visiting here, and we get a lot of visitors on the weekend, here is one good piece of advice, whether you should trust the person that you're seated, seated under week after week, as this person delivers the gospel to you. Are they always telling you that you need to repent, or are they saying we need to repent? Are they always telling you what you should do? You should forgive. Or are they saying, man, we need to forgive? 
Are they telling you to invite Jesus into your heart? Or are they saying, man, we need to have Jesus in our heart? You can be forgiven. Or does he say or she say, we can all be forgiven? This type of individualism did not exist among the Hebrew people. It's, it's definitely part of the Western mind. It's foreign to the Eastern mind. They always thought in community, we need to join together as God's people. We need our sins forgiven. We are guilty. We need atonement. We need to meet with God. We are guilty as a community, as the people of God. And as the priest would place his hands on the goat, remember when we kick-started this series with Rosh Hashanah and we read the prayers, we stood together? This is the moment in which they would read these prayers on the Day of Atonement. In what ways, God, has our community fallen? And then they would repeat together, for the sin which we've committed before you with unclean lips, and for the sin that we've committed before you with impure speech, and for the sin which we've committed before you willingly or unwillingly, for all these, O oh God of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. And then they would finish by saying in the book of life, blessing, peace, and good sustenance, may we be remembered and inscribed before thee. May we be forgiven. When the people of God came to the day of atonement, remember they had engaged in 10 days of introspection. Let me tell you, if you ever were to take the time to engage in 10 days of introspection, you'd come with a list of your sins. You'd say, oh my goodness. If you ever took the time to think, man, whoo, No book is long enough for this. That's the trouble. When you come close to God, you're going to get grace after your eyes are open to how badly you need it. May our sins be forgiven. Can you imagine, just quickly before I read this next thing, can you imagine what our church would be like if we really did bear each other's burdens? See, everybody wants to quote Galatians 6 in terms of helping when we're suffering. But the context of Galatians 6 is sin, that we're bearing each other's burdens of sin. So that when my, what, imagine what would happen if you and I were so close that you could come and you could say, Pastor Jeff, I have done this horrible thing without fear that I would cast judgment and condemn you. Instead, I would be moved to tears and put my arms around you and say, okay, man, we're going to defeat this together. That's when you're a real community. When you're not casting judgment, when you're loving each other, when you're bearing each other. In other words, when you're, caught, when you're struggling with a sin, that sin impacts me because I want to help you win the victory over it. And so, when Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He's to lay both hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness. And it was done as the Lord had commanded. Every time I read this text, I wonder, how do you recruit the the guy to do this job? I mean, how do you advertise this? I mean, do you walk up to somebody? It's got to be somebody non-Jewish, a Gentile, say, look, man, I know you may not understand this, but I have a job for you, pays well. There's going to be this large gathering. I mean, a lot of people. And there's going to be this goat. And... We're going to do a ceremony, and we want you to take the goat out into the wilderness and throw him over a cliff. Oh, sure, I can do that. Now, now, it's important. You've got to to take him all the way out. We don't want that goat showing up in the village again because he's got all our sins on his head. Make sure he goes over the cliff. And by the way, all the sins of 210,000 people are on this goat. So we do know that the man appointed for the task would be a Gentile. Again, if you're a Jew leading this goat, you don't want to be anywhere near all the sins of the people. And they took this very seriously. They, they truly believed that God placed all the sins of the community on the head of this goat. So that when the goat left, celebration would erupt. And in the words of a famous theologian, I'm sure most of you know, I didn't come up with this phrase, the goat has left the building. The goat has left the building. Now let's go back again. Imagine you're a very sinful, again, you've had a bad year. Each year is a year of hope. And for Thousands and thousands of people in this euphoria setting in, they'd be thinking in these terms, will the goat leave this year? Will God come down this year? Will he deliver us this year? Will my sin keep my people from prospering? Again, pause. What would happen if every member of one and all church took their sin so seriously that they were afraid If they lived a life without repentance, it would impact the prosperity of the entire congregation. 
That's how they thought. They never thought, my sin only impacts me and it's none of anybody's business. No. They were communal. They were a community, God's new community in the world. Now, stay with me. This is where we move from the Yom Kippur of the Old Testament. And now, remember, it has a messianic fulfillment and a prophetic fulfillment. What is the messianic fulfillment? There's this fascinating Jewish tradition. These are, there are references to it in the Talmud, in the Mishnah as well. These are, again, ancient Jewish commentaries. They're not the inspired word of God, but they give us a pretty good indication of Hebrew practices and feasts. Now listen to this. You know, there's a red cord that would be tied on the head of the goat. And that cord, of course, would leave a ring on the goat of the head. And then that cord would be tied, the red cord, to the altar. Now again, it represented the blood because the life is in the blood. A life had to be taken the way Jesus sent his death. So as the red cord is tied on the, mora- on the uh, altar, where everybody could see it, over the following eight to ten days after Yom Kippur, this cord that was red would turn white. It would move from red to white. Isaiah says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So God, the God of miracles, gave his people a miraculous sign. Yeah, I'm the holy God who takes sin seriously. Yeah, I'm the holy God who punishes the evildoer. Yes, I am a God who should be feared, but I'm also the God who loves you so much that I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Do you know how precious this passage in Isaiah 1.18 was to the people of God? Still is to this day. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now after hundreds, this is amazing, after hundreds and hundreds of years, are you with me? You got to think a little bit. After hundreds and hundreds of years, this feast, this mikra, this rehearsal, this foreshadowing, Do you remember what happened in John 18, 19? Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Now, if you had a crown of thorns on your head, what would happen? You'd have a ring around your head. And what color would that ring be? Red. Remember we said goat is the word azazel, which means take him away, take him away. Pilate says to the people, what should I do with Jesus? He responds in John 18, 14 through 15. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away. Take him away. Azazel, Azazel, crucify him. Now let's keep going. He was led outside the city of Golgotha to be crucified, right? Who led him to be crucified outside the city? The Jews? No, a Gentile, a Roman. Who cheered? The Jews. Our Azazel is led outside the city by Gentiles. Who is Jesus then? Jesus is our Azazel. The goat has left the building. And all who call on his name and fear his name shall be saved. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Now let's keep going. The red cord turns white days after the day of atonement. The scapegoat has been sent outside the city. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. The Mishnah, this is almost unfathomable. The Mishnah, which is a Jewish source from the first century. It's not a Christian source. These are Jews recording this history. It was collected and written by rabbis who actually rejected Christ as Messiah. So we're talking about, when we talk about, look, look. When we talk about the, uh, the Mishnah, we're talking about an oral Torah Okay, instead of the written down law of God, we're talking about the oral traditions recorded, how the Hebrews saw the feast and how they interpreted the events of God. So here's what we learned from the Mishnah. It actually records, these are people who do not follow Christ as Messiah, not Yeshua. It records that 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the cord stayed red, stopped turning white. 40 years before the destruction of the temple. Now, what happened 40 years before the destruction of the temple. Well, first of all, the temple was destroyed by the Roman general Titus in the year AD 70, right? Which means that somewhere around the time or the common era 30, the cord stopped turning white. Somewhere around 30 AD. Now, what happened around 30 AD? Christ was crucified. The sacrificial system became ineffective 
Because Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, was slain on a Roman cross. There's no need for a scapegoat anymore. The Lamb of God had been slain before the foundations of the world, and all who call on his name shall be saved. (laughs) That's why in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is referred to as our ultimate high priest. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered all, for all time, one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Do you know why Paul keeps addressing you and I as saints? Because we are. Pragmatically, we may fall short, but God views us through the lens of the blood of Jesus. And because he sees us through the lens of the blood of Jesus, you and I are deemed righteous. Righteous. Which means we can come into the presence of God because our Azazel, our Azazel, crucified, walked outside of the city by the Gentiles, crucified by the Romans, and he has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. The goat has left the building. How many of you remember? Any of you remember, remember Chris Wade? Remember Chris Wade? Anybody remember him? Worked with me behind stage for years. Stage manager. Interesting character. Never met a man, I don't think in my lifetime, Well, let's not say that. That's a bit far. But let's put him in the top ten of the people that I've met who loved Jesus so much. And if you know his story, you know, the Bible talks about to whom much is forgiven or or, or those who have been forgiven much tend to love much. And Chris had destroyed his life with alcohol. He destroyed his wife, his kids, and he knew it. And I'd never met a man who truly loved understood that the situation in which he was in was totally his own doing. And even though his wife had left him and gone on to marry another man, he was so kind. He loved her still and realized he messed this up. But he loved her and he wanted the best for her. Same thing with his kids. I never once heard him blame anybody but himself for his predicament. And I, I often worried about Chris because I thought, man, he serves the, man, he's always serving. And so this, you know, this side of me thought, man, is he, try, is he serving to kind of earn merit and favor back with God because of all the sin in his life? But, you know, how do you ask a guy that, you know? Hey, are you, uh, it's obvious your heart is not right, that your motives are impure. No. Is he trying to make amends for his sins? And then in 2017, I brought a similar message out of Leviticus 16. And it was the first time I used that phrase, the goat has left the building. And I walked backstage after the sermon. And Chris, who was typically just smiles all the time, I walked back, they started to play the decision song, and he was weeping like a little baby. I said, Chris, I thought something had happened. Got a phone call, maybe something happened to his kids or maybe his wife. I said, Chris, you all right? And he couldn't breathe, he couldn't get it out. And he looked at me with tears rolling down his cheek, and he said, the goat has left the building. He got it. I sat with him over in San Dimas Hospital three days before he died. He was on kidney dialysis because of the alcoholism. And we spent, I don't know, an hour together. We just reminisced about everything. He talked about how much he loved church and loved being backstage and loved bossing me around, telling me when to go out and when to come back. Before I left that evening, it was late in the evening too, he looked at me and said, Pastor Jeff, the goat did leave the building, right? I said, yeah, Chris, the goat left the building. You're good to go. And he died a few days later. The father wants you to experience forgiveness. He does. So I don't know who you've cheated or who you've betrayed or in what way you've experimented with something that you knew better, or what forbidden waters that you've stolen. 
I don't know what actions haunt you still to this day because you wounded people that you love and now you deeply regret it. Someone that you promised to protect, instead you offended. I don't know what sacred thing that you violated, but I know there's a part of us, all of us, deep down inside who, that wonder, can God really forgive us? Can, I mean, can God really forgive me for this? And do you know, do you realize that the whole sermon on Shavuot, on the day of Pentecost, was exactly that. And do you remember what happened to the people? They said, oh, we, we are guilty. We, we need remedial help. Help us. What do we do? And what did Peter say? It's as plain as day. In Acts 2.38, he says, here's what you do. You repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, the Father wants you to experience forgiveness. He really does. But there must be atonement. Can you imagine somebody in the crowd, Yom Kippur, cavalier attitude? Oh, yeah, same thing. Every year, goat on the head, walk him out. Yeah, woo. But in his mind, he's over there thinking, ah, what's the big deal, man? God does it every day. My, my life doesn't matter. Do you think, remember what Grace read to us? He will be cut off from his people. You and I have no idea how God responds to a cavalier attitude concerning his grace. He wants to give it. He does because he has the heart of the Father, but he's not going to violate his own nature. Your sin and my sin must be dealt with. And that's why, listen, this is the end. Yom Kippur reveals the nature of God. On the one hand, Yom Kippur is God's idea, right? God came up with a ceremony, and it's a pretty good one. He's not content with separation between us and him. All of this originates from the mind of God to communicate to his people his love and provision for them. However, on the other hand, Yom Kippur comes with a warning. You can't just waltz into the presence of God on your own terms. Nadab and Abihu did that. They died. And my biggest concern, now stay with me, this is the end of the end. My biggest concern is that this generation has created God in their own image. They say, God, this is what you should be like. You should like all the things I like and dislike all the things I dislike. But that wouldn't be the real God, right? Because the real God's always going to contradict you at some point. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. You don't get to determine how you come into the presence of God. So Yom Kippur reminds you, you come on God's terms, not yours. And his terms are very simple. I don't know how it could be any more plain. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Turn away from your present life of sin. Repent and be baptized. Come clean into the presence of God. Now, finally, that means what is the prophetic fulfillment of Yom Kippur? Wait a minute. We got Yom Kippur in the Old Testament, the original. We got Yom Kippur when Christ, our Azazel, is led out into the wilderness, crucified. But what is the, what is the prophetic Yom Kippur? The prophetic Yom Kippur is an end to grace and mercy. When Rosh Hashanah and the trumpet blows, that's it. It's a time for judgment. Now you are judged for your sins. The time for grace and mercy and forgiveness, it's over. And now the holiness of God requires all sin to be punished. So here's how they coincide. If you try to approach God on your own terms, you'll be devoured by the fire, devoured by the fire of God which means soul disintegration. You'll be escorted out of the camp into the wilderness and thrown over the cliff. Your sins will be on your head. The ramification of all sins, the sins of the world will follow you into eternal separation from God. Do you understand that? God says, I love you, I've provided a way, but don't come to my throne cavalierly. Come knowing that your sin has to be dealt with and Christ, your Azazel, has delivered you from sin and death. Today's the day of salvation, but tomorrow is the day of judgment. So as we make our way now, next week toward Easter, woohoo, to Sukkot, which is going to open our eyes to a lot because you've done the homework. Imagine being here in this series, you've gained a great understanding of what all this is about, which means Sukkot's going to mean more to you. The final party with God, let's get this party started with God. It's going to be so much more meaningful to you next week because you've gone through this. But can I tell you, respond to God's invitation now. 
Remember, he gives it to you, but you got to respond. You got to sing up the hill. You got to go and watch what God has done. You got to repent. You got to say you're sorry. You got to verbalize your trust in Christ and you got to plunge your past. And I challenge you if you've never gotten serious about your sin, hey, what if those prophets who think that Christ is going to return in October are right? I don't know. They don't either. But what if they were right? It's possible. Today's the day of salvation. And friends, if you have never given your heart to Christ and you've never been baptized, what on earth are you waiting for? This could be the greatest Easter of all time. Father, thank you for Yom Kippur. Thank you for this journey that we've been on. And I pray right now in Christ's name that our eyes would be open to the work of God at Yom Kippur in the Old Testament, to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world in the New Testament, and to the prophetic Yom Kippur when the day of judgment comes. And those whose names are written in the books, who've chosen to relate to God on the basis of law, will be eternally separated from him. But those whose names are found written in the book of life, because Christ's death has been credited to their account, therefore we too shall rise to walk with Christ in eternity. I pray our eyes would be open to those two realities now. And I pray that if there's one person in this room who has never been baptized into Christ to present themselves clean before the Father, this would be the weekend they would do it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. When I hear a message like that, I can't help but go back to when I gave my life to Christ and I was baptized. You know, when I reflect on that time, I can't help but be so, so overwhelmed with gratitude that the goat has left the building. Because for so long, I carried around the weight of my sin like a ball and chain. You know, and Pastor Jeff told us that God wants us to experience freedom. And maybe you're here tonight and you've never tasted that freedom. Maybe for whatever reason, you've been thinking that the sin in your life is too big. What you've done is too bad. And there's just no way that what Jesus did on the cross could cover that sin. I'm here to tell you that that's wrong. God wants freedom for you. He wants you to live the life that he has for you, but you'll never do that if you're carrying around the weight of shame and sin. And so if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never just laid it all down and let it go and admitted to the fact that he died on the cross for you just like he died on the cross for me, then today is the day. But maybe you, maybe you did give your life to Christ at some time. Maybe it was when you were a child or, or some other point in your life. But along the way, you've, got a little bit, you've gotten a little bit lost. And, and the enemy has accused you and convinced you that God doesn't love you anymore. Then today you can recommit your life to Christ. So I'm going to ask that everyone in the room would close your eyes and bow your heads now. And I'm going to count to three. And if you're ready to break out of the shackles that the enemy has had you in, if you're ready to experience freedom that God has for you, then I'm going to ask that you would raise your hand. One, two, three. I see you back there. Praise God. I see you here. I see you back there. This can be the most amazing Easter that you've ever experienced when you realize that all of your sins are washed clean. So if you'd like to receive Jesus now, just raise your hand. I see you there. 
And now why don't we all just pray this prayer together, if you'll just repeat after me. God, I know that I'm a sinner, but I have a savior and his name is Jesus. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross on my behalf. Please forgive me for my sins and walk with me through this life and into eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me as we give a round of applause to those who made that decision today? Now, as Pastor Jeff said, the Bible says to repent and be baptized. And next weekend here at Easter, we are going to celebrate, celebrate that new life in Christ. And so if you've never been baptized, maybe you were baptized as an infant and it wasn't something done on, of your own volition, then head on out to the yellow table after service and you can sign up there. But if you made a decision, man, I encourage you to swipe that QR code. Let us know that you decided. And if you're watching online, go to oneandall.church forward slash Jesus, and someone will be in touch with you to let you know what the next step in your journey might be. But will you all stand up with me now as we respond to the good news that we just heard through a time of worship?
are wide open, ready to welcome us. I don't know what it is that you're bringing in this weekend. I know what I'm bringing, <laughs> but I don't know what you've brought with you. But we serve a God who wants you just as you are. Doesn't matter what happened yesterday, what matters is right now in this moment that you can come to him, broken, hurting, confused, and he loves you just the same. As we continue in worship, our prayer team is gonna come forward. And can I encourage you this weekend don't leave this place feeling the same way that you walked in. Come and let him meet you where you're at. Our team would love to pray with you this weekend. There's nothing too big or too small for Jesus. And so as we continue in worship, don't leave this place without talking to him today.
Everything was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was a orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, sing it. I ran not like rain. Out of the worship team. So, so good. Well, hey, uh, a couple weeks ago, we told you guys that we were going to be sending resources and mission. You can take your seat. I'm sorry. Uh, that we we're going to be sending mission teams and some financial resources to Poland in, uh, in order to help the refugee situation. Um, that's happening because of Ukraine. And I wanna let you know that yesterday, our second mission team uh, headed over there and they're both, two of the teams are there now. And so I was hoping that we could pray quickly just to cover them with prayer uh, as what they're, they're doing over there is important and God goes with them, but we just wanna be behind them and, and cover them now. So will you join me? Heavenly Father, I just wanna thank you Thank you though for those who heard the call and were willing to go and help over in Poland, Lord. I pray that you would just um, protect them, that you would keep them safe, that you would ble bless the work of their hands, Lord, and that they would be your arms and feet as they provide hope and love and resources to those who probably feel as though they have lost everything right now, God. I ask that you would work in that situation and that your will would be done, but that those who don't know you, that this would bring them closer to you, Father. Bring our, our friends back home safely and be with their family here as they wait for their return. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my friends, the ushers are going to come forward now and begin to pass the offering buckets. But while they do that, why don't we check out the screen to see some of the things going on here at One and All. What an amazing service we've had so far. I have two quick announcements as we go into this amazing season as a church. One is Easter. You see, Easter reminds me that Christ didn't just die on a cross. He actually redeemed our hope. He actually restored our lives with his resurrection. And so we're gonna celebrate that. We're gonna celebrate that across nine services on all three of our campuses. What an amazing time to invite someone that you love. I truly believe that one of these invite cards that you may have received may lead to a changed life. So what an amazing time to just tell your friend, your loved one, your family who maybe doesn't have a relationship with God, maybe someone who needs to know Jesus, say, hey, why don't you join me for an Easter service? So we would love to see you there. And two, the weekend after Easter, we're starting a new series called Pumped. I know I'm super excited about it and it's just an amazing opportunity for you to invite your friend. Well, church, thank you for joining us today. We love you. So I heard that here at San Dimas, you guys are already at max capacity for the 9 and 11 on Sunday. So I wanted to take this opportunity and give you guys a little bit of good news. We still have room at Rancho. So you can come out and hang out with us out there. Or you can come see my friend Matt Chavez at West Covina. That'll work too. Uh, but we do have seats here for the Saturday night service or the Sunday morning sunrise service at 7 o'clock. But you're going to want to make sure that you make reservations. And the reason that we are doing the RSVP system is we're expecting really big crowds 
crowds this Easter. And we want to make sure that you guys have seats. So it's not to make things harder on you. It's really just to ensure the fact that when you get here, there's going to be a seat for you. So if you haven't done it yet, pull out your phone right now and uh, go to this QR code. And while you're thinking of it, because if you're anything like me, you'll leave and you'll be hungry thinking about dinner and you'll forget to make your reservation. So do it now. And then also, uh, if you haven't gotten some of those invite cards or you just need more because you've invited like so many people, uh, grab some of those invite cards at the yellow table on your way out of service. And let's get the word out, guys. We have hope to share and this world needs it, right? But I'm praying that this week as you leave here, you would really just spend some time in reflection with God. Don't get caught up in all of the other things. Really be pondering the fact that we all need Jesus because we're all sinners, amen? So now let's end as we always do with one hope, one life in Christ. Have a great night, everyone.